Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Friday live stream. So just like that video took a look at, sometimes it's just better just to hang around to see what happens. And today we're going to take a look at, looks like uh, the numbers are in for PPI, the producer price index, and it looks like the inflation is cooling. Now, this doesn't mean that this won't be revised. This doesn't mean that these uh, numbers are 100% accurate, but it's what Jerome Powell is going to look at when he re cuts rates. So it's important for us to look at that to see where we're going. So today, uh, we can see this is from uh, Market Watch, and we actually talked about this yesterday in the uh, NFA live show with Ben and Guy. We took a look at initial jobless claims, CPI, the core price and core consumer pr price index, and core CPI. And we can see that it actually came in uh, a little bit above expectations, but it had decreased a little bit from the previous markings. So that is good, but what we really wanna take a look at, especially right now, kind of like behind the scenes, is what's called the producer price index. So consumer price index is what we pay, producer price index is what they're paying for goods and services, and it is a precursor to CPI. So if producer price index is going down, historically and statistically, it should follow or lead into core CPI and consumer price index because this is what the producers are paying. And we can see that uh, it looks like previously, uh, producer price index it was 0 0.2, the expectations was 0 0.1, and it came out flat. And that's good. That means the producers aren't paying so much for goods and services. Core PPI, came in 0 0.2 previously, expectations was it was going to be 0 0.2, but it came 0 0.1. PPI year over year decreased and also core PPI year over year. So if we wanna take a look at that in a little bit streamlined process, this is what we've got. So PPI, previous 0 0.2, expectations of what the market thought it would be is 0 0.1, but it came in flat. Core 0 0.2, 0 0.2, actual 0 0.1, PPI year over year, again, we decreased from the previous year at 1.9 to 1.8 and core went down again. So what does that mean? Well, when we take a look at if inflation is starting to cool, that means Jerome Powell's like, great, we can cut some rates. What does that mean for the rates today? Well, if we take a look at the uh, CME group, let me refresh this, maybe it's gone up or down. 83 and 16, nope. <laughs> looks like we're still going to cut the rates, but it's gonna be 25 basis points from 475 to 450 or 450 to 475. So that is essentially what we're gonna have and that will not be until November. And what does that mean for the market? Well, a little bit of a pump. And I'm not really too enthralled with these numbers. I mean, we've been pretty much range bound the whole time. Bitcoin's at 62, Ethereum 2.4. In 24 hours, we're right back to essentially where we were at before. Actually, we're lower than what we're actually at. I remember, I remember just a week ago, let me take a look here. Just a week ago, were we not at 60, yeah, almost 64,000 and we're still down. So don't get too excited yet. I don't see a lot of big happening until after the uh, presidential election in November and we'll see where it goes. But uh, again, I've always thought that 2025 was the year, but congratulations for today. That's what we have for numbers. Let me know what you think about that in the comment section. Then also we've got some news in our market to go over. First of all, Ethereum, let's be honest, it's been under underperforming quite uh, massively. And uh, you can watch a, a plethora of different YouTube channels that are out there. And we can even take a look at the Ethereum ETF, really not doing too hot. And here's another indicator of where things are going. Uh, Lat AM Bank or Latam Bank, however you say it, Litio ditches Ethereum for Avalanche as demand for RWA or real world asset vaults grows. So not to be like, of course people are like, who cares? It's just a small bank and, and uh, not a big deal. You're right, it's not a big deal. But if you take a look at where things are going, it's kind of like just little indicators you're gonna put the dots together. So Litio, a Colombian neo bank, is enabling customers to access U.S. Treasury bills through crypto products. That is great. And that, I got to tell you, I don't understand why the current administration does not embrace crypto digital assets like it should, because it is giving access to people all over the world that otherwise would not have access to U.S. Treasury bills. And that, of course, is what essentially runs our, our economy just about. 
as we have uh, uh, been issuing those like crazy. And if we want to turn the, that money printer on, this would be a good thing. I just, it just, it goes over my head why they don't embrace it. So this was launched in February and the vaults for US Treasury bills have already garnered $80 million in trading volume. Again, not that much, not a big deal. Why the change? Growing demand for yield pots is forcing the operation to scale. Avalanche's low transaction fees and consistency were cited as reasons for picking the chain. So they have moved from uh, Ethereum to Avalanche. And PayPal did the same thing. They did uh, stable coins, uh, their pay, pay USD stable coin. And they actually did use Ethereum and are still using Ethereum and Solana. And they've kind of, they've made a press release said that, you know, for other different aspects, we're going to start to move towards Solana a little bit more. However, Visa uh, has actually implemented uh, Ethereum for their real world assets. So everything's all over the place. But when I take a look at just these fees, we can see where it's going. And Ethereum, this is from uh, Milk Road, but uh, GUE base price is 56 GUE, which means per transaction, it's approximately $3 in three minutes, which you think, who cares about $3? Well, if you're using Avalanche, this is from Snowtrace, uh, the median gas price is uh, a penny, a penny and a half. So we'll see how that holds up when they start to have more transactions. And that's the big thing because a lot of these different chains look awesome right now, but let's be honest, they're not holding down the entire global network of payments and transactions. If Avalanche can have a massive amount heaped onto it and still keep those transactions low, that'd be amazing. And it is a layer one solution. So we'll see how it works, but uh, you know that's what we have. And then lastly, before we move on, people will say, well, Rob, what about just having them use a layer two solution? Look, I don't know why the bank moved from Ethereum to AVAX, when maybe potentially they could use something like Base, or maybe they could use something like Optimism or Polygon. I have no idea. Maybe it has to do with finality and how the bank operates. I'm just reporting what's going on. So don't shoot the messenger. If you're a big Ethereum maxi, I get it. I own Ethereum too. I own Solana. I own Avalanche. I own all this stuff. So I'm just telling you, like this is what's going on behind the scenes. So just be aware. Anyhow, let me just think about that. And then also, Going into a little bit of the legal aspect, uh, Chevron. There was a case that was brought, I think it was before the, the Supreme Court. And essentially what it allowed to do was three letter agencies like the SEC, the OCC, to pretty much, if there's kind of any kind of ambiguous laws, they could pretty much make decisions. And with the, set, with the Chevron defense overturned, that's not going to happen. And this was good news because we thought that the SEC was of course litigating uh, through enforcement. And uh, we didn't like that, or excuse me, regulating through enforcement, not litigating, that's what they're doing against Ripper right now. So we thought this would be great, but uh, Tom Emmer, uh, one of the uh, congressmen said, no, this is not going to really help us too much. And here's what we have. So United States Supreme, yeah, United States Supreme Court overruled the Chevron Doctrine in June, meaning US courts could no longer our U.S. courts no longer need to defer to federal agencies like the SEC when interpreting ambiguous statutes. The problem with this amb these ambiguous statutes is because Congress doesn't take action and actually put this into effect and go, OK, this, we, we're not going to have ambiguity. This is what a digital asset is. This is what a security is. This is what a commodity is. But they've been dragging their feet and they've been letting Gary Gensler get away with nonsense. And this has to stop. And this is where Tom Emmer says only a and again, don't shoot the messenger, only a Donald Trump win in the November 5th presidential election and Republicans controlling the House and Senate could make Chevron impactful. Only then you could maybe see for the first time in 30 years, a government that gets a budget and actually enforces the budget and holds these agencies accountable. I have to disagree with Tom here. I do not think that if you have a Republican president, a Republican Senate and a Republican House of Representatives, everything will be great. Usually what happens is you want a consensus from everybody involved and you can make concessions along the way. I do not personally, you're welcome to argue with me in the comment section. I do not want to have a total all the way through Republicans all the way through. Democrats, I don't want them all the way through. I would like a little bit of a placement 
of different opinions so we can actually get uh, different laws and regulations passed when it's not just one side. So uh, I don't know who you're going to vote for in the presidential election, but I just thought it was interesting that he says this is totally uh, well not going to work unless we have one person here. I think it could, but uh, we'll see. And then also BitKit. And I have to applaud BitKit for this. BitKit tightens token listing standards amid scam concerns. First of all, I'm an American citizen. I have no idea. I don't think I can even use BitGet. I could be wrong, but uh, pretty much I'm stuck with uh, Kraken and Coinbase and Crypto.com. But I have to applaud these exchanges that are actually waking up and going, hey, maybe we shouldn't list all this trash. So this is what we got. October 10th announcement. New listing requirements for BitGet stipulates compliance with several factors such as fully diluted valuation, past development and investment records, a detailed business plan, lockup periods, a token distribution plan, and social media activity before they do any types of listings. Now, if you're unfamiliar, behind the scenes, uh, a lot of these exchanges, pretty much what they're asking for is money. Give us this amount of money and we'll list your token. That's what happens. And BitKit is going, no, we're gonna do something a little bit different. Instead of having everybody get wrecked, maybe we should take a little look into what these projects are. Bitkin is based in the Seychelles and is one of the largest crypto exchanges by trading volume. I had no idea. It holds over $3.4 billion in user assets with more than $1.5 billion in trading volume over the past 24 hours. You know, when you have that type of money just kind of sloshing around, you can actually be a little bit more conservative in the different crypto that you actually list. The exchange said projects tokenomics will receive special attention, which includes an analysis of token supply, distribution, and utility. In additional tokens with a locking period below two years will receive additional uh, scrutiny. And just to finish this up, users put in considerable effort to gather documents to register. We appreciate that. and want to make sure we protect them, that they can expect the same from projects. Here's my question to you. When I just read out there, circulating supply, fully diluted volume, tokenomics, all the things we just talked about, do you have a grasp of what I just said? Or would you like some more information and maybe a little bit more a deeper dive into that as far as like the basics of crypto. Anyhow, I'd like to hear what you want to say uh, in the, uh, in, down the descriptions. But uh, for me, I mean, we know these things for the majority of it, but I just want to make sure that everybody's on the same level. Because if we don't, I need to catch everybody up and maybe I'll just put a video, a basics video out. But let me know if you think that's uh, warranted. And lastly, Bitcoin. So this was... I found this interesting because, I mean, let's be honest, there's always going to be a problem with something. And this was from October 8th. The Texas town residents sue Marathon Digital over crypto mining noise. I can see it, actually. If, if you have tinnitus, you've been in the military or something like that, and you have this, you know how annoying noise can be. It can drive you insane. And I know people will just kind of, some people might dismiss this, but it's a thing. And let's talk about this and we'll talk about energy consumption. So the lawsuit claimed that some residents have suffered sensory, emotional, psychological, and health impacts due to constant unrelenting noise and vibrations from Marathon site. And the reason why I bring this up is because I think every concern should be brought up and there should be a solution. Some locals had experienced fatigue, headaches, memory, loss, migraines, and tinnitus, which is just ringing in the ears. Pre-existing health conditions such as high blood pressure have worsened for some residents. Even in their own homes, residents can hear the uh, marathon crypto mines noise and feel its vibration. The group also claimed that this has resulted in increase in electricity bills and decrease in their property values. Now, the rest of this was cut out for some reason. But what Marathon said was what they're trying to do then is they're going to submerge these miners in liquid cooling apparatus so that you won't hear so much of that, which I got to tell you is a pretty good idea because it will, do, it will reduce the energy costs because it won't heat up as much. So again, there's a problem. Here's a solution. If you got a problem with too much noise and we're, we're too close to residents, we'll just stick them into uh, some kind of li liquid cooling. But then this last part got me. Increases in, a, in a electricity bills in their property values. So there's different miners across Texas where I'm at right now, and they're doing quite well. And they're actually reducing the cost 
of electricity. Here's what I'm talking about. We did this, this uh, breakdown of, it was called Why Bitcoin? And one of these we talked about was, I mean, one of the different aspects of, you know, people always complain about is like, it's destroying the environment because blah, 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 and using too much electricity, whatever. But if you take a look at it, it is a lot of electricity. I mean, by country ranking, South Africa, Thailand, China, all the way up there, uh, we're pretty much, we're, we're, Bitcoin is above a lot of the different countries out there. Now, I know people say, well, look, that's the price that it has to pay for the most decentralized and secure computerized network in the entire planet. Trust me, I got it. I'm just telling you that there's another answer. First of all, for like energy consumption, did you know that a billion dollars in natural go gas goes up in smoke through flaring? Why do they flare? Flaring, have you ever seen this? If you're in Texas and you've, you've dri driven past a lot of different of these plants, you'll see like just this burning uh, structures. Flaring helps stabilize pressure during the oil gas extraction, which is what people have been doing. So what they do here in these different towns, they go, look, if you're going to lose a billion dollars of natural gas just up in smoke, and of course that could contribute to global warming, if you want to believe in that stuff, is that you can just say like this, look, we'll go over there, we'll be right next to it. Instead of flaring the natural gas, it goes into a generator, produces electricity. Electricity is used to mine Bitcoin. It's a simple solution and it works out just great. And then this was uh, on top of that, Bitcoin miner Riot earned nine and a half million dollars for shutting down during the Texas heat wave. So if you take a look at transmission and distribution from primary energy source, because uh, I hate to tell you this, but electricity just doesn't get created. You know, if, if you have coal mines, you have to burn that coal to produce electricity. And then from that, you have to, distribute that electricity that's actually being produced into consumer devices or into retail or into uh, commercial uh, locations. And to do that, there is a loss of uh, as, far, as far as conversion. So if you don't, if you have a problem with, with losing that, more than 6% of energy used for electricity is lost in conversion. Again, that's conversion from the primary source to electricity. Once you just move everything closer, and then also for this, if you have an excess amount of energy, which is being produced in Texas, especially with wind, solar, and uh, hydro, you can say, hey, we've got some excess energy here. Would you guys like to pay for this for Bitcoin miners? Sure. Hey, guess what? We have so much demand, especially during these heat waves, which we had a massive amount this, this summer, shut off for a little bit and we'll pay you just to shut down, which they like, great, sure. So for this, you have that part. Hydroelectric power is the same thing. And then this one was an opinion piece from the Rockdale mayor. And he talks about how Bitcoin actually revived his community. And he states here, this is from uh, ah, Ward Rodden. Rockdale was once a manufacturing hub, home to Alcoa Aluminum Plant, opened in 1952 and became one of the world's largest smelting facilities. It was the economic heart of our town. Unfortunately, they picked up and moved away. In 2008, energy prices rose. New regulation forced the Alcoa plant to shut down. A small town of 5,500 felt like the rug was pulled out from under, under us. Although the plant closed, it left behind a massive energy infrastructure, including substation and transmission lines, which didn't help the people that were there. The miners moved in. They started to use the electricity. They started to use the infrastructure. And the mayor says, well, at first I was like, are they gonna be here for a while? Was Bitcoin even real? As both mayor and a lifelong resident of Rockdale learned that Bitcoin miners are deeply invested in the community. These companies employ hundreds of, hundreds of people, created mid-skilled jobs, allowing locals to find well-paying employment. Bitcoin mining companies have invested over a billion dollars in Rockdale, companies only to local causes. Bitcoin mining is the fastest growing industry in Texas and Texas leaders should recognize the benefits of Bitcoin mining. It's like a digital oil well. So I just want to bring this to everybody's attention. So when you hear this, this stipulation of say, well, well, Bitcoin mining is destroying the world because there's so much electrical use. You can say, no, no, that's not true. In actuality, in a lot of different places across Texas, they actually shut down. There's problems with conversion loss. They can use hydro, water. Uh, they can use uh, wind and solar. And they can use the excess energy consumption, which will actually lead to more jobs in these different areas. So when you get this type of uh, pushback, which you're going to get this pushback at some point, just uh, know what it is. Anyhow, I don't know if that helped out.
And then also, <laughs> a lot of stuff today. Solana has 100 million active wallets, but most are empty. And if you're a Solana holder like myself, you don't want to hear this stuff, but you have to because you have to understand what you're holding. So this is what we got. Solana's monthly active addresses count as soared past 100 million, which is pretty good. That's 100 million active addresses. Pretty awesome, right? That's a lot of people. But it doesn't make any sense. This is a big jump from 509,000 monthly active addresses recorded by Artemis at the beginning of 2024. So you're telling me that in 10 months, it went from 500,000 monthly active addresses to 100 million? And of course, you could say, well, Rob, you, can, you have uh, pump.fun and you have all the Solana meme coins. And sure, I get it. But I'm like, that's a lot. I don't know. Supporting metrics indicate the most active wallets on Solana don't hold any Solana. Let me say that again. Supporting metrics indicate that most active wallets on Solana don't hold Solana. Skeptics attribute this explosive growth to bots. According to Solana data provider Hello Moon, more than 86 million users held zero Solana in their wallets over the past month. Is that true? Well, I linked this Hello Moon website so you can take a look at it. But it, yeah, daily active users with Solana wallet balance. You've got, well, now it says 81 million. That's in one month. So it's gone down about 19, 18 million or so. But you can see right here that, oh, excuse me. No, it is right. Because 81.96 million total users don't have any Solana. Wow. That's a lot. So you just have a, these are active, daily active users with Solana wallet balance. I'm still trying to wrap my head around this. No Solana? How the hell are they active? Less than one Solana is 15 million. One to 10 Solana is 1.5. That's pretty good. 10 to 100 Solana is 478,000. So you can dig into these metrics as much as you want to. I link this one in the description. It's got a whole other bunch of stuff here. But the question is why? Why is it like that? Well, here's a here's a possibility. Dan Hughes, the founder of finance platform Radix, said when you send to a centralized exchange or a sex, you have a proxy address which the exchange generates. Adding that some DeFi services may also use intermediate addresses. You send your tokens at address and the exchange immediately moves them to a hot wallet recording whose tokens they are in the back end. So it sounds like they just kind of produce this uh, as you're moving things between a wallet and a centralized exchange. However, Austin Federa, head of strategy of the Solana Foundation, said that bot transactions, while of lower economic value than human ones, are still transactions. Let me say that again. Austin Federa, head of strategy. While all lower economic value that human ones, bot transactions are still transactions. That's the point of a network called Solana. There's a lot of stuff that's not economically viable and not economically possible in the Ethereum ecosystem today. So you let me know what you think about that in the comments. But I'm just telling you that I still think 100 million, it's got to be a lot of bots, just saying. And then also, before we get into the Q&A, I found this, this chart, and it's kind of concerning because... I think we're on the precipice of a bull run. Of course, everybody says that, but we'll see if it actually happens. I still think it's going to happen. Some people aren't with me, but that's okay. You weren't with me back in 2021 either. If you take, I, first of all, I don't know where you're at. I, I don't know if, majority of my viewers are here in the United States, about 45% or so. And then it goes into Canada, Mexico, Australia, and then parts of uh, Europe, and then down the list of Southeast Asia. But if you double your investments, your investment, and it's tax-free, so whatever you're into, like you put in $10 into Bitcoin and Bitcoin goes from 60,000 today to 120,000, and you put 10 bucks in, congratulations, you have $20. But let's just say that you got into some meme coins or whatever else, and you double, 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 double. Isn't it interesting that when you compound tax-free two to four, 
four to eight, 16. What was that? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 19. Wow. You gotta do it 19 times if you start with two bucks to, to make a million dollars. What I found was disturbing is that even if you did that and you're taxed at 25%, that million would only be 72,000. Now, of course, you'll say like, Rob, well, I'm not taking profits in every single time that I do this, but yeah, that's true. But let's just say that you you did this tax free and you doubled your money for and you made a million dollars, right? Which is not which is great, depending on where you're at. Some places you can live like a king. But if you do that and here in the United States, if you take long term capital gains, that's twenty one percent. So right there, right at the top, you're taking two hundred thousand dollars out. Not to mention if you take profits along the way, and I've done that. That's one of my rules. So if you're doing this, just know that uh, you know to add that in to the equation of when we're talking about taking profits. And another option you have is what I've been, when I have up here on the very upper left-hand corner, a crypto IRA with iTrust. Now there's a reason why I use it. I've used them for now for three years and they just opened up for a whole host of new cryptos. So the majority of what I own is in Bitcoin. That's like 70% of my Roth IRA. But what's great about Roth IRA is that you don't pay taxes when you take it out after the age of 59 and a half. And then also, I don't know if you know this, but you can trade within your Roth IRA and there's no taxes. So all this stuff here goes away. So what I'll be doing over the next couple of months, I'm gonna show you what I'm buying into and how I trade from within my Roth IRA tax-free to what I'm going to eventually have when I, well, at some point I wanna take it out. So anyhow, if you're interested in that, there's a link in the description which goes over a lot more information about uh, iTrust and the Roth IRA, but that's it for today. So look, if you like today's video, and it was long, consider subscribing, hit the thumbs up and all that great stuff. Now, if you wanna go over, do a little Q&A, I'll answer all your questions on a Friday, and we will go from there. All right, everybody, thanks so much. You gotta take off, take off, we'll get going.